Good morning, uh, and welcome to our uh, March edition of Wake Up Newport. I'm Steve Rosansky, President and CEO of the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce. And we have a great program for you to, uh, this morning. It's our traditional March Wake Up Newport, where we have uh, the new mayor for Newport Beach come and speak to you. Usually that's live and in person, and uh, we would have liked to have done that uh, this year as well, but unfortunately we're still in the, in the realm of Zoom. But uh, I think that the, you know, the um, presentation will be just as compelling, I'm sure, and probably a very graphic rich, which sometimes we don't get at the, uh, at the library. So uh, maybe it'll be even better. Um, I share this, uh, the stage this morning with my uh, compadre here, Rush Hill, who is the head of our government affairs committee. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Rush. I will just remind you um, a couple things as people are loading into the room here. Um, Brad's gonna give his uh, talk this morning and then we're gonna have a Q and A session afterwards. If you have a question, please type it into the Q and A, not into the chat box. We'll be monitoring the Q and A for the questions. So uh, and I'm sure you'll have plenty of them based on uh, Brad's presentation. And we'd like to get to as many of them as we possibly can. So that with being said, uh, we'll see you on the backside of um, Brad's uh, talk and uh, take it away, Rush. Oh, good morning. I too would like to welcome you to the uh, March edition of Wake Up Newport. Uh, we're very excited to have our, uh, our mayor with us. Uh, I have the privilege, uh, while Steve is forced to be in his office, uh, the mayor, I think you'll find is in the mayor's office. I'm in Joshua Tree at the Hill Family Ranch. So uh, uh, I decided to keep my distance uh, from the presentation. I hope you also know that you have two old mayors in addition to a new mayor on the uh, on the program today. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Mayor Brad Avery was elected to Newport Beach City Council in 2016. He represents the second district, which is Newport Heights, Westcliff, Newport Shores, and, and West Newport Beach. And he's lived in Newport since 1969, grew up sailing in the harbor, and after graduating from Newport Harbor High at the old age of 17, Brad spent three years as a professional sailor crossing the Atlantic several times, several times and cruising in the Caribbean and Mediterranean. Returning home, he attended Orange Coast College and transferred to USC, <clears throat> that's a little school up in LA, where he received a degree in journalism and communications. He later received a master's degree in public administration from Long Beach State University and an MLE certificate from the Harvard Graduate School of education. Uh, since 1979, Brad has led the community voting program at Orange Coast College. <clears throat> the program facility, as most of you probably know, is on Newport Harbor along PCH. Soon after he was hired, the program lost its state funding. In responding to that crisis, Brad worked towards transforming the school into a self-funded operation supported through course fees, grants, and private giving. Today, the program is one of the nation's most comprehensive boating schools, enrolling more than 1,500 students per year. Prior to his election to city council, Brad served on the city's Harbor Commission for five years. His other civic and community activities include serving Colonel Amar Sherman Foundation Board of Trustees, the Orange County Sanitation District as a director, and the Oasis, the Oasis Senior Center Board of Advocates. From 2016 to 2018, Brad served as chair of the city's water quality and tidelands committee. I think you'll see that he has a great background in leading the city at this point in time. A lifelong sailor, he has also volunteered at two of his favorite yachting organizations, eventually serving as Commodore of the Newport Harbor and Transpac Yacht Clubs. He lives happily in Newport Beach with his wife, Julia. I'm very proud to present to you our mayor, Brad Avery. Thank you, Rush. Good morning, everyone. Um, that's a, I was uh, given an introduction by our uh, PIO, John Pope, and uh, Rush has done a great job uh, of doing that for me. So um, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, a couple other items on my list. Uh, the, uh, one question I have here is why I ran for council. And uh, I don't have a good answer. I think what happens um, 
to many folks is um, if you, when you're around the city, uh, you slowly get drug into things like this. And uh, so I uh, first ran for uh, Harbor Commissioner because I was concerned with some issues on the Harbor. And uh, after a couple of tries, uh, was um, my application was accepted for a, a position in the Harbor Commission about 2011. And that kind of brought me into the milieu of uh, city uh, government and to a certain degree politics and uh, over a period of five years uh, really informed me. And then, um, and I know this is a very educated audience here with uh, the chamber uh, in 2016, uh, you know, Tony Petros decided not to run. And uh, I was urged by my friend Duffy Duffield to run and a few others, so so I did. And uh, it's been, um, it's not uh, totally enjoyable, because people ask that question all the time, but it's uh, hugely engaging. And so I, uh, from that standpoint, I really enjoyed uh, my time on the council. And at this point in my career, now that I'm retired, um, it's um, even even more so. It's uh, it's a full what I call adult portion, uh, being on council uh, and particularly being uh, mayor. Uh, but uh, it's got huge rewards as well. So it's kind of my pitch to, especially to uh, younger folks uh, in the city. To get involved, and uh, you know, we 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 need people stepping into uh, uh, roles at the city all the time and through our boards and commission structure. And so, uh, you know, I, I certainly, along with a lot of other people, uh, encourage uh, people, folks to to get involved. So, um, and then just as uh, you know, people, it's interesting when you're mayor. People think that's uh, a position of of power and um, I don't, um, of course, uh, to those that know, it's it's not. You're just, uh, you're still a city council member and you have, you know, a little more influence over the agenda. But my philosophy on city council is that we need to work together as a body for, for the people of the city. And uh, to that degree, um, I, that that is my uh, my mantra is just trying to whatever it takes to get us to work smoothly together, to focus on the issues that we have uh, coming before us, hopefully narrowly constrained to the business of the city, if you will, uh, not getting sidetracked with uh, other sort of more political issues that we see some cities dive into, uh, advocate when we need to, absolutely, for instance, on the arena issues, you know, absolutely, those are directly related to uh, the health and long-term future of the city. And we need to advocate for the city's uh, position on things like arena uh, very strongly. So uh, of course, this is called a state of the city address, and uh, but I'd like it to be sort of more of a conversation and we'll have questions and answers at the end. Um, and many of you have been through this before in the live format. Uh, and so uh, if you will, quote unquote, state of the city, uh, always starts with the budget, unless there's something else going on like a COVID crisis. So uh, I'll just speak to the COVID uh, situation, uh, the pandemic, uh, because I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because I think there's a lot of information out there. Um, as you all know, we're very close to being, um, you know, getting into the red zone, very close to, to opening. Um, and those of, <laughs> we've all been driving around recently and uh, we, I think we've been going out to our favorite restaurants and, and uh, I, for one, have just noticed this increase daily, it seems, of the pulse of the city from traffic uh, to upticks in businesses, uh, going out to restaurants. Um, my wife and I are, are calling friends and we're, we're going to our favorite restaurants that have outside dining. And I won't name them, <laughs> but uh, only because I don't want to play favorites because I think all of our uh, restaurant owners uh, do a fantastic job, and we were so fortunate to have such diversity uh, of, of uh, restaurants and menus in our town. But uh, so it really makes me excited, and I think we're all feeling it. And I think we're going to have an extraordinarily big summer. I'm just convinced of that. And I mean that in terms of uh, really trying to, you know, the getting our 
this is coming hopefully in the nick of time for many of our businesses. Some are doing okay and some are not doing well at all. And uh, we just can't, you know, wish this to open uh, enough. And we need to support uh, our small businesses. And every council member is behind this. And this is what I mean by um, council working smoothly together. We're, we're united, I find, on the council on most of the issues. And uh, where we're not, that's okay. I think this is a council that accepts and recognizes that each member has got uh, a different point of view and uh, they absolutely represent their constituencies and uh, we just have to work together um, and get get to a point where we're pushing the right things through through the pipeline. So uh, to that end, uh, I'd like to start just uh, we'll bring up a slide here for uh, the budget and and again, I think many of you are already pretty aware of uh, the uh, budget in Newport Beach in terms of its strengths and weaknesses. And so we're going to pull that up right now on our screen. And so um, uh, this should be uh, starting off with property tax. That's our anchor, as you know. And so property tax revenues have remained steady and with a slight, you know, sort of normal uptick in uh, revenues. And that is really the, the like I said, it's the anchor uh, to the city's budget. And it, it's, uh, it, it does not, uh, it just keeps going at a regular rate pretty much. And obviously it's subject to downturns like in uh, 2008, 2009, but uh, in, in the last decade, it's been quite an engine. And the sales tax uh, looking across, you can see 2021, uh, we lost a lot in the sales tax. And then in, if you look at that further down, transit occupancy tax is probably is the hardest hit of these big categories. And, um, you know, while we expect the sales tax uh, to increase as we go forward here, and it already is increasing, I believe, um, uh, transit occupancy tax is projected to lag a little more. And indeed, um, uh, some some folks say it may lag for a couple of years. It'll be interesting to see uh, what happens there. And uh, our other revenues are a mixed bag of things, parking fees and grants, uh, uh, all kinds of other fees, recreational fees. So uh, that, as you can see, is those, those numbers uh, on the other uh, budget revenue are, are, are down somewhat from uh, 2020 just reflecting uh, what's going on. So uh, in, in the last budget cycle, uh, the Finance Committee uh, presented to council a really conservative budget, uh, obviously not knowing uh, at that point uh, in May and June uh, what the outcome of the pandemic would be. And so we see down there uh, at the bottom of 2021 budgeted uh, a 199 million budget and you look at the year before and it was 229 and the year before that very similar number and uh, so we now because of that conservative budget and uh, because things uh, the strength of property tax and uh, strength of higher than expected sales tax revenues uh, we're looking at a right now at about a 17 million surplus which you know is sort of a misnomer. It's not, it's a surplus, but, you know, obviously the budget is very conservative and it's, you know, uh, 20 million less this year than it was the year before. But nonetheless, we will, uh, barring any unforeseen difficulty, end the year with a surplus in that 16 to 18, 19 million range. And uh, so then as we get closer to the uh, end of the fiscal year, uh, it'll be up to the Finance Committee to recommend to Council uh, through uh, the department heads uh, what we do with that remaining uh, surplus. And uh, as many of you know, we've we got to that uh, reduced budget by cutting back on a lot of uh, capital projects. You know, most of that's public works. Uh, and uh, also, we've had a hiring freeze for quite a long time, and uh, we continue that. So. Uh, there's been some real savings going on at the city, as well as these uh, these deferments of, of projects that uh, department heads felt that they could handle and, and get us through the year without uh, impacting services to residents. 
and to businesses. So uh, we've got another slide up here. Um, the general fund revenue, um, you know, obviously decreased during COVID-19 impacts, and um, uh, we're looking at TOT expected 60% recovery by June, and that'll be the one to watch um, because uh, that's the one that's really been impacted. And so we're really um, hoping for a, a better recovery uh, of our, our hotels and our all of our uh, um, uh, rental operations, um, short-term rentals. And so that's, that's one that could make a difference in the budget if it recovers faster. And the city over time received uh, CARES Act reimbursements of a million dollars. And uh, that was for, uh, you know, uh, mainly public safety, all of it impacted by uh, the impacted costs from the COVID. And we also received about a half a million dollars. Well, we will receive, it's in progress, uh, from FEMA uh, for COVID-related items. So we've uh, achieved uh, about 30 million in savings through the hiring freeze and delayed equipment purchases, and uh, obviously the big one, the capital expenditures. So things like certain roads did not get repaved. A number of uh, projects were, were suspended. So going forward, um, those projects will be ranked and ordered uh, and have, we'll have another look to decide at the end of the year which ones we move forward on, which ones are the most critical. So obviously, these, those are the, the things that uh, are most important to us. We want, we want roads to be safe. We want uh, uh, sewer and water to uh, continue to flow and uh, the critical infrastructure be sustained. So I think that's what we'll see when we come together uh, later in the year, May, June, and uh, the budget's adopted in, uh, at the end of June. So look for that. And, uh, and, and it's an interesting thing to, to kind of watch it come together um, and uh, see what, what kind of comes up to the top is the most important things. And along with that, speaking of important things, we've done, a, I think, a very good job, the Council's united on this, on paying down our unfunded liability. And so that's, those are all the pensions of uh, previous employees that have retired and they've earned that retirement. And uh, we, you know, we need to protect that uh, locally and statewide. So uh, we'll continue to pay down our uh, unfunded liability. So we're going to get to, in the next uh, two decades or less, we're going to get to uh, where we'll have no uh, unfunded liability. There's an assumption there, though, that CalPERS will remain solvent, and uh, and uh, assuming that happens, uh, that they will uh, that there won't be huge um, changes in the discount rate to the cities, which makes a huge impact on that. So there's some assumptions there, but uh, you know we we can't live on assumptions. We, we the policy is we've collectively decided, um, and we think our residents are behind us on this. We haven't heard otherwise of taking a responsible path and every year contributing at least $5 million or more, if we have it, uh, above what our annual payment is to CalPERS to get that unfunded liability down uh, over the uh, ensuing years. All right. Yeah. Okay. So next slide, please. So we're on to some grant programs, and, and this uh, is really about um, – uh, small businesses, and you can see there's three different uh, pots here that the city has worked with. And this is, you know, uh, uh, this is government in action uh, trying to uh, do what it, it can to um, protect and, and uh, shore up impacted small businesses in our town and all over the county, of course. And you can see at the bottom line, which counts here is the results of uh, grants to businesses, uh, you know, five to ten thousand each, and then the CDBG grants, five to ten thousand, and then fifty-eight grants uh, there at the, on the far right of five thousand each. And I think, um, you know, for some businesses that are are quite large, these aren't huge sums. But what we're really focused on are really, in some regards, the smaller businesses that where this does make a difference, and this does help keep people employed. So we're, um, we're, these didn't just fall on our lap. This is an example of our staff working hard to capture these grants, and they're doing that all the time to uh, 
shore up our small businesses. And, and if we see one that's uh, going to come, it's available for some other aspect of the city, we're going after that. That's one of the things that uh, I'm most impressed with is um, the city's ability and um, its uh, its expertise in acquiring uh, uh, grants to uh, add to our uh, budget. All right, and uh, now we're going to go into some capital projects. So this is the uh, what was the Lido Fire Station. Um, it's got a name uh, that's to be determined. Uh, words like a peninsula or cannery have come up, but um, that's a small part of this. This is an extraordinarily huge upgrade for our city's uh, fire department uh, in terms of facility on the peninsula. And uh, those of you that, uh, in the Lido area, that fire station was 60 years old, very tight. And so this is located on the old McDonald's lot on the Balboa Peninsula. And the city purchased that property a couple of years ago in anticipation of this move. And this allows uh, the uh, doors on either side, so trucks can move in and out on either side of uh, basically Balboa Boulevard there and operate uh, much, uh, much more efficiently. And the uh, response times are nearly the same for almost every, every location in the city. This is obviously didn't move very far from the old fire station. But uh, it gives uh, it gives us the going forward, um, uh, you know, strength of our fire department uh, in the future. And as you know, we've already uh, renewed uh, the Corona Del Mar fire station, and so we're we're doing this as we can. Um, there's different ways to fund it. This particular uh, fire station we've funded with private uh, with uh, uh, we went out and got financing and uh, through bonds, and uh, it's about a 1.7% rate, which is extraordinary. So the council, and, and it was recommended to council by finance committee, that uh, we take this route and then preserve our capital. And again, this is kind of a COVID lens on this for uh, if we need that 10 million for something else, because that's about the budget of this is about 10 million. So that's been financed at an extremely low rate and uh, we can pay it off any time. So uh, it's just keeping our powder dry in terms of uh, a bit of liquidity in case we would have needed it in this uh, the pandemic had worsened. So um, it's an exciting project. Uh, a big thing to me on this uh, that doesn't get talked about is the, the um, uh, seismic issues on the peninsula. And uh, so this station has got, of course, totally up to code and very well set up um, for seismic and uh, which is crucial for all of our fire stations in the event of a large earthquake we, we just we want those doors to open we want the trucks to roll and uh, we, we want the buildings to, to remain um, stable so um, i think that's a, a a pressing need and uh, as we look forward i think uh, down the line here we can expect uh, the uh, the Peninsula Fire Station um, down by uh, uh, by the library, the, the library combo fire station um, at about Island Avenue, to be uh, replaced as well when the budget allows. And uh, what do we have next? We have, I think, the lecture hall. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the. Uh, proposed uh, library lecture hall. And uh, this is a private, public-private uh, effort. So our library foundation is contributing to this, probably 30 to 40% of the funds. And uh, it's still in, in flux in terms of design and incorporating it into uh, the library grounds there. You can see in the uh, north corner there uh, where the uh, current um, uh, community hall is. Uh, this will be an addition to that. So there's there's more here than just the lecture hall. It's kind of a rework of the of the grounds, and, and it makes it more flexible in terms of having events. So uh, we're excited about this. We're excited about the community partners uh, partnership in terms of uh, uh, private giving to this. And uh, these things are really important moving forward. And uh, we're, we don't anticipate looking forward 
in the next 10 years in terms of things like development agreements being as robust as they've been in the past. So for these kinds of projects, which aren't, um, they aren't needs like a fire station, but they're, they're important projects for the fabric of our community. And uh, they're, they're projects that reflect a, a great community, one that's aspirational and one that wants to come together in a place like the lecture hall and, uh, and uh, hear great things uh, from folks around the world uh, related to uh, all, of, all of our interests. So this is a good one, um, and uh, we'll see where it goes in terms of where we end up in, in the funding side of it. And then we've got the Junior Lifeguard Building, and I'm showing you a, 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 a layout of it, and this is at the uh, Balboa Pier, uh, but it will be, in, it will actually be not on the sand, but uh, let's take up some uh, parking, but we won't reduce our parking because there's other parking to be captured. But uh, this moves it away off the beach and the Coastal Commission likes that. But this is set up in a reflection of the strength of uh, the Junior Lifeguard Program, what an iconic program it is for the city, how important it is to us. Uh, and uh, it also shows the willingness of residents to also uh, to provide private funding for this. So this is another public-private partnership. And I think that the uh, Junior Lifeguard Foundation right now is up to 1.7 million toward this project, which will be in the four to five million range. And uh, we're continuing to uh, work on this from a budget standpoint as well. Uh, and so we're getting close to the design, um, the, the, uh, out, uh, the, the overall look of the building. And uh, if you attend the upcoming council meeting, um, you'll see those discussions. Uh, we're just trying to get it so it's right. And we have concerns from residents about views. Uh, we we want to do it right to where it's a minimal impact, but um, a real benefit to the community. So in addition to being the junior lifeguard building, as you know, the junior lifeguards are up and running in the summers, but this will also be a community center uh, for the peninsula as well. And uh, we expect to derive income from this uh, from our rentals like we do at Marina Park where we rent out rooms, that kind of thing, to help defray the cost of uh, maintenance over time. So uh, as many of you know, we dredged the harbor in 2012 and we uh, intend to um, dredge it again because the silt keeps coming into the bay and the last dredging didn't get down as far as we wanted to. So it's critically uh, it, it, it's critical that the bay remain deep uh, and that helps water flow, but it also keeps us ahead of future dredging uh, projects that may be forced upon us through storms. And when we have big storms, uh, the bay fills up faster with mud and sediment from uh, the uh, San Diego Creek that runs into the back bay. So we need to stay ahead of it always. And uh, we're going to dredge the harbor down to its uh, required federal depth of 20 feet in the main channels. And this project will start, you'll see it start uh, this summer with the Army Corps of Engineers dredging the, uh, the uh, harbor mouth and past the Coast Guard station and up to uh, near, almost all the way up to the ferry. And then this, we will take over uh, with city funds. And we uh, also received a grant from the federal government uh, for the department uh, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers for $8 million. And we're putting in $8 million. And we're going to, uh, we've got some other money coming in and uh, we've already got 1 million in permitting and planning. So this is a big deal and it will happen um, this summer, the first leg of it, and then perhaps the next year, the, the uh, second, if you will, leg of uh, dredging the harbor. And one of the things you're gonna hear about is uh, what they call a confined aquatic disposal site. And in the harbor, we have uh, still ha contaminated areas of the uh, bottom. And this is, uh, the, these are amounts that uh, we uh, can't take offshore. And so the idea is to uh, build a, uh, dig a deep hole in, in the turning basin of the channel and deposit these materials 
into this hole and then cover it with good material. And this is common, this is done in a lot of areas, but it does have residents concerned uh, about the safety of it. And uh, we're gonna have ongoing discussions uh, um, you know, to flesh this out. But um, we're going to work hard to demonstrate that this is a, a good project. It's something that's safe and we can do it. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's, uh, the material's already in the bay, it's right there. So we just need to get it contained. That's the main thing. So we're working on that and that's a big part of this and it adds to the cost. So this is about cleaning up Newport Harbor uh, and also keeping the harbor open uh, for the foreseeable future. So once this dredging is done, the harbor should be good for at least another 20 to 30 years. So uh, the vaccine rollout, I think everybody's uh, pretty aware of this as well, but uh, my main point of this, um, it's there's some, many more uh, places that are now giving out, or, you know, giving out the vaccine. And uh, as we roll into this, uh, more vaccine is coming all the time. And uh, my main point here is, I just want to compliment the extraordinary work of our fire department and Chief Boyle's effort to get his, um, his crew, his EMTs and uh, his paramedics all trained up to give right now, we can, uh, we're, they're certified by the state and we can, the city can give the vaccine. So we've been going out to other agencies and supporting them and uh, we're ready to do it uh, when we're able to, when we're given the green light to uh, open up uh, local clinics here in Newport Beach and uh, provide the vaccine to our residents, to our seniors, whatever, whatever groups uh, can come forward and receive it. Is extraordinary effort by the fire department. We were ready months ago to give up to give the vaccine, and we we were not able to only because uh, we weren't given the green light uh, by the county. So uh, the county wanted to focus on the pods, understandably so. But uh, I, I think it's just another example of uh, what great public safety operations we have in Newport Beach. So the um, biggest item probably uh, that impacts our future is the uh, regional housing needs allocation or RENA. And this is something that is potentially a uh, significant threat to our, um, to the quality of life in Newport. And the reason this is because they, we are being mandated to plan for 4,800 plus housing units in Newport Beach. And how that rolls out and how it's done over the next 10, 15 years is going to impact us. Uh, and so we have to have really good planning here. We have to have good circulation, roads, infrastructure. There's a, there's a million questions about this, how it all, all, how it all happens. But we absolutely have to plan for it. And uh, this is being pushed on us by the state and every other city uh, contending with this. But Newport, as we all know, is a pretty much a built out city. So we, if we're going to do this, we need to uh, incorporate it in a way that these projects are done on a human scale, that we, we don't uh, increase uh, the traffic the impacts and uh, we keep it out of neighborhoods. Uh, we keep it in discrete places where we can build uh, sensibly scaled um, housing uh, throughout uh, the city in basically five different locations, West Newport, Newport Center, um, Newport Coast, and the airport area. Uh, then there's some uh, also areas where we can, smaller sections where we could probably zone this and have it built over time. So the city's not going to build it, of course, this is going to be zoned. And then uh, when with zoning changes and then developers will come in and figure out you know what needs what needs to happen and how they can afford to build in this town and build affordable housing there's a huge affordable housing component to this and the economics on the face of it do not work so given the land values 
uh, it's a very difficult thing uh, for us to pull off, say, 2,000 affordable and very low income housing units on top of uh, 2,000 additional units. So this is um, something that's going to play out over the next uh, few years, but it's a crucible right now because uh, we're under the gun to uh, to uh, come up with a plan, and uh, we need all the citizen input that we can on this. And so you can participate and should participate in this, and the city's having some workshops, and you'll see down there is a website, newporttogether.com, and uh, to find out when we're meeting. We've got the next uh, workshop date, it's uh, March 22nd at 6 p.m. And so that's a review of our draft housing element update. So these are these are critical meetings and we're not getting enough participation in my view. So we, we, we need folks to, to chime in because without civic participation by residents and by businesses, uh, uh, government doesn't work very well. Government works when people who are living life in their homes, operating their businesses, when they participate in the process, when they contribute their viewpoints, when they contribute their suggestions. So uh, you don't want to leave council to figure this out, trust me. <laughs> We're just seven residents and we need more, more input, more conversation. So please, uh, if you could, uh, if, by virtue of being on this uh, Zoom uh, call, um, you're, you're an interested person. So uh, please show up and uh, help us out. Thank you. And uh, I want to also talk about our homeless situation. We still get letters every day from people that are very concerned about it, and rightly so. And I just want to tell you that uh, we're, we've got a team on it and we're working. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but uh, you can easily get them. You can call any city council member. Uh, you can talk to our, um, our homeless advocates for the city. So, uh, and we've got uh, a couple of things down here. I want to speak. Um, one of the issues we have is panhandling and we really want to discourage um, people giving money to the homeless and instead give money to um, uh, to the site down here, Newport Beach Gov slash give. And that money will go to supply homeless with temporary shelter, with clothing, that, those kinds of things. But the panhandling uh, just uh, tends to increase homeless activity. So we need to, uh, to work on that. But uh, right now we've got, um, a lot of effort going into this. We are partnering with Costa Mesa for a shelter up by the airport, and that should be open about May 1, and that will give us more flexibility in terms of uh, uh, encouraging homeless folks to get uh, to the shelter and hopefully get the services they need to, um, to move forward into permanent supportive housing to uh, get help with any addiction issues they have, mental health, mental health issues they have, and we're working this all the time. We have um, Officer Cynthia Carter with the police department that's full time on this. And uh, we have Natalie Basmajian with the city. She's our homeless coordination officer. And they are out on the field every day talking to our homeless and engaging them. And they know every one of our homeless population. And that population is somewhere between 25 and 40. And we're having a Success comes hard, but it is coming, and uh, we have people uh, exiting the streets, as they call it, uh, on a regular basis. And that doesn't mean they don't return to the streets, but this is hard work. It's 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 in the trenches, and uh, there's no simple solution. It's just all of us coming together, and it's not just the city, but it's the houses of worship, and it's the NGOs like Save Ourselves and uh, many others all working together. So I think from uh, as, a, as an individual in the city, what can you do to help? And I would just uh, check out uh, the website, newportbeach.gov slash give down there at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. So uh, 
one of the other major issues we have in town uh, that we hear about a lot is short-term lodging. And Newport Beach has a strong history of uh, having people come down for the summer. It's been going on since uh, the city started in 1906, uh, when, the, when the red cars started coming down here from LA, people pitched tents on the beach. And uh, so that, that tradition is alive and well, and we have 1,550 uh, Permits now uh, available. If there's some. There's a list right now, a waiting list, but that's a lot compared to any other city. And um, uh, so we need to manage it, and that's proving to be difficult in certain areas. Overall, 90% of 95% of short-term rentals run just fine, and they're respectful. And uh, so it's like a lot of things in a city. Uh, we need to focus on uh, those folks that aren't good neighbors that come into town and, and they don't respect uh, their neighbors and, and, and uh, they don't respect uh, keeping our city clean and neat. And so we're working on more code enforcement for this. But at the same time, uh, we also understand that uh, short-term rentals are, are, are part of our community and, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and a good part in a way if we're we're going to be inviting people to uh, come down. We've got to be open to that. And uh, a lot of homeowners uh, depend on revenue from short-term rentals to, uh, to uh, stay in their houses. So this is um, an ongoing problem in certain specific areas of town. So we're focusing on those and we're trying to come up with solutions for those residents that are impacted by noise issues. And that's primarily what it is, noise issues from places that aren't managed well. And so we are working hard to get those property owners, those business operators to manage their properties. So that's on the hot, on the hot button right now. Thank you. And um, uh, just a short talk about the airport. Um, so, you know, we obviously want to limit growth uh, of the uh, flights overhead. We want to work on the noise uh, we've got a committee that's uh, working on that all the time, led by Diane Dixon and Noah Blom. And the most important thing we need to do, of course, is advocate to the county. The county owns the airport. We don't have a lot of control here, but what we do have is a, is a solid agreement uh, over the number of flights allowed. And uh, we need to keep that agreement in place. And it also uh, is... Uh, speaks to the curfews. So that's why we're not hearing, for the most part, we're not hearing takeoffs at night. So the curfew from uh, uh, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. is an important part of this. And so the biggest thing we can do, and our committee does, and we've got other folks in town that are impacted, they're watching that agreement carefully to make sure that the county and the FAA uh, keep to their part of the agreement. And uh, we watch carefully for any backsliding and at the same time do whatever we can to reduce the impacts on residents in this town. This is something that's crucially important for the quality of life in Newport Beach, for property values. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. It's a part of uh, our daily life. But over time, we have to do what we can to mitigate the noise issue. And so this is not going away. This is going to be with us going forward as it has been since the airport was first started. So uh, I urge you again to uh, get involved and uh, attend a few aviation committee meetings. This is sort of like uh, the rest of uh, the problems we have in the city. Nothing's easy and uh, it's easy to, uh, you know, <laughs> send uh you know, uh, furious emails uh, to the council, which we're happy to get in terms of, you know, getting more informed. But uh, the solution to this is more residents really understanding, taking the time to attend a meeting and really understanding uh, the issues and maybe getting involved with the com one of the committees. So uh, that's an important part too. So again, public participation is key to solving these complex issues because that's where the good ideas come from. The good ideas come from our residents and our businesses, folks that are that are impacted, and people who have different points of view. We we need to hear it all. Thank you. So, um, 
we're we're really close to being you know wide open again and uh so i want to just let you know the city hall has resumed with covid 19 protocols so the permit counter plan checks uh are are open now you don't have to drop your plans off in the bin anymore uh the city library is open with reduced capacity the outdoor recreation programs youth sports have resumed and additional programs and in-person services resume as the county uh reaches red tier status so we're expecting that any time now and uh so this is going to happen and uh we're really excited things are going to change dramatically here in the next uh, we feel in the next month yeah um so it's time for questions well, I, that was a very comprehensive uh, report there, Brad. Covered, I think, most of the areas that I was thinking about. But we do have a couple of questions in the Q and A. Why don't I ask the first one, and Rush, you can take the second one. So it says here, um, <clears throat> with the new housing and apartment construction that's going on and has gone on recently, are we making any significant progress towards our arena mandate? So, I, in other words, you know, we're seeing construction around town, obviously. Um, things are happening, uh, the shop off project uh, over in the airport, um, some other projects have been approved. Do those go towards our new RENA numbers or are those going towards our old RENA numbers? Well, it's depending on the project, but yes, they are going toward um, some of them. Most of them are going toward our, will go toward our RENA numbers. But the, the, the hard thing here is, and it's unresolved, is how can we deliver the moderate to low income units given the cost of land in this area. I mean, there's no more expensive land anywhere in the country than right here, maybe someplace in Connecticut. Well, so, you know, developers don't develop out of the goodness of their hearts. They, they, they are there for a profit and, uh, you know, building low income housing is, is, is not that. So that's what we're going to, you know, obviously we need to incentivize that. And so then there's ratios of, that are involved in terms of number of, of uh, units that are quote unquote, maybe luxury units to moderate income units to low income units. Um, but this is, this is our, our real challenge here is to develop is, is we, I think we can, we can, we're going to build more housing will get built, uh, but it's gotta be the right type of housing to uh, fit the state's mandate. And that's that lower income housing. And so we need to, again, look at various ways that this can be achieved. Uh, but frankly, uh, it's a huge challenge. And, uh, and it's not just us. Every city in the state is faced with this challenge. And it's particularly hard for us because of the land values and the fact that most property and there's no great swaths of land that are unaccounted for. So all this property is private. And so a lot of, you know, we can't force landowners to, uh, to, to sell their properties to developers. And so this is, this is going to be difficult. And I, I question how we're going to get there. I, I really do. That's me. I'm not speaking for council. I'm just speaking as a resident looking at this. Um, and I think, down the road, um, it remains to be seen, you know, whether or not we ultimately deliver on this. We're committed to meeting the state's mandates, to following the law, but it's, it, it, I will just say, uh, Sacramento, where this stuff gets turned up, um, really, it, it's a one size fits all. And uh, to a built out city like Newport Beach, it's an extraordinary challenge to, to produce this. We can do the zoning, Friday, but yeah. then it's up to property owners and developers to take it from there. Kind of a follow-up question on the same topic uh, has been asked, what is considered low income in Newport Beach? Oh, you know, I don't have that number rush, you know. Um, uh, well, Mayor, I'll yeah. jump in, maybe help you out, Mayor. Um, I think that uh, it's, all, it's all keyed off of uh, median household income in, in Orange County. And that number is actually quite high. You know, people with 
you know, think low income is like twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year type people. But when you're looking at what our median income is here in Orange County, we're talking about people, you know, making sixty to eighty thousand dollars, depending on whether you're talking about low or very low uh, income. So it's actually um, fairly high. But even at, I think at those levels, I, I remember watching one of the city meetings and someone was saying like the subsidy required for low income housing to be to build one unit would be that like in the neighborhood of like $300,000 a year or not a year, $300,000 subsidy just to build one unit. And when you need 2000 units times $300,000, that's a huge number. Um, and so that I think that's what you were getting at, Brad, is that, uh, you know, it's fine to be able to zone for the, this housing, but to actually build it, you know, to acquire the land and then the construction costs is prohibitive, even even at those income levels that people can, you know, uh, that are high compared to what people might normally think is low income. Right. And I know there's a development on PCH uh, 35 condos and there's three uh, low income units. And I think they're going, the, the rent was going to be between seven and $900 a month, you know, and that's, um, uh, again, it's just from a business perspective. So that forces uh, developers to do, to economize on projects and figure out ways to uh, provide that. And, uh, and I think, uh, I think we can potentially wind up with projects that are not, um, they're not good projects in terms of how they look, in terms of their scale, um, uh, because the economics force sort of a, the maximum amount of units on a parcel as high as, you know, no, as high and uh, out to the max lot lines all, all you know, and uh, so that's what I worry about is the, is the quality of this development going forward and how well it fits our town. You know, ideally, in a perfect world, we've got these four or five locations. These should become essentially villages, like our, our villages that we have now, you know, that, that have places where people can shop, places where people can drop off their dry cleaning, where they can uh, recreate. And they shouldn't be these just lines of apart, uh, blocks of, apart, of apartment buildings and condos without services. And, and so we can get, keep people out of their, you know, they can park their car for the weekend and, and get around and, and recreate and get the things they need, go to the store on their bicycle, that kind of thing. That's what's really important here. And that's what I worry about. And the airport, you know, we've got a couple of good projects up there, but we need more services for the folks that are going to be uh, up at the, uh, up in that area, renting those condos, uh, living in those apartments. Maybe I can just quickly follow up on something, this project that you just mentioned and another project. So uh, that 35 units with, uh, I think, an 11,000 square foot retail building on the front on Mariner's Mile there in Coast Highway is the first development to come through under the, you know, the changes that we made back in 2006 to the general plan, which would allow some residential um, construction dwelling units to be built in the Mariner's Mile area there below the, the cliffs. So basically the, the coast line side and then the, the boat yards that have traditionally been there. So that, that project was approved at Planning Commission. So uh, two questions. One, is that project being appealed to City Council? Is the Council going to be looking at that project? And two, um, what about the much larger project? I mean, where are we with the Machete project that's probably more like a couple hundred units um, further down the street? Well, um... Yes, yeah, so, so uh, I uh, call that up for, for review by council. So that's uh, going to be at a future meeting. And uh, the, uh, my chief concern is the residents um, are, their point of view is that the views from Cliff Drive Park are going to be impacted by this, um, by this building. And I don't know if that's the case or not. But there was enough concern that I, I want to make sure that we completely understand what the view shed is, because you cannot impact the views, uh, particularly coastal views, from a public park with a project. And so uh, we, there, there have been some um, generated uh, 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 sight lines um, 
and uh, but I don't think what the uh, proponent has submitted is enough, at least in my view. So I think we just want to get cold comfort. That project fits. It, it maxes out all, as I discussed earlier, it maxes out all uh, all the things that are required. So we've got some uh, quote unquote retail. We've got some three low in, or very low or low income houses, uh, housing units there and the rest of it. And so, you know, the, the private property rights being what they are, uh, if it's meeting all those requirements, it's fine. So, but another requirement is the protection of the views from Cliff Drive Park. And so those cannot be impacted. And so we need to to definitely see uh, in a clear way that they're not impacted by this project. And so that's why it's coming back to council to figure out how we do that. Mm -hmm. And maybe you just tell us where, right, I think where, we have where's time. Where's well, where's the other project further up the road? You know, I'm not sure. I haven't seen that in a while. Um, I think there's uh, I've heard there's some issues in regarding um, where this where a uh, another stoplight's going to go on PCH and it needs to handle both sides of Coast Highway for that project. You know, there's two sides to it. Um, you know, one side's all uh, condominiums and, and the other side is luxury condominiums um, and uh, shops along the waterfront. So, uh, but I think it's going to take a little while longer to figure out the traffic flow patterns for that, to, to figure out where the signal is going to go and it needs to um, handle both sides. So the city doesn't want to see two signals go in to accommodate that. So the driveways from both sides of PCH uh, have to line up and work off of one, one signal. Okay, thank so, you. Mm -hmm. Brad, uh, different topic. Um, um, and that's uh, how does uh, the Newport Beach City Council feel about uh, hero pay? Has that been discussed? And, and if it were to be discussed, who actually pays for that? Thanks, Rush. I, um, I have not had a discussion or heard a discussion about that from council members, so I, I don't know. And um, right, so um, it's quite a thing to uh, force an increase like that on a business. And um, in general, uh, uh, I, I, I just, I think, just speaking for myself, I think council would be reluctant to uh, push that. Very good, very good. And maybe we can just well, we're approaching. Let, let's just clarify one thing. There was a question here about the budget figures that you showed. It says, does the 2020 year represent a calendar year or a fiscal year? So, you know, our budget year is from July 1st through yes. June 30th, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So the 2021 numbers you were quoting there is the 2020-2021 budget that right. is currently in effect yeah. right now. Yeah. Yes. So we're currently about 17 million ahead of that very conservative budget that was put forward during sort of the, the you know, one of the deep spots in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So that's just obviously finance, uh, rightly so in, in my view, um, being very conservative on this and uh, really holding the line on um, any new hires, holding the line on projects that we can defer just to make sure uh, if COVID had deepened, and which of course it, it's gone back and forth, just to protect uh, the budget and uh, keep our current employees and keep the overriding uh, thought was to uh, cut, but don't cut services to the public. So I think uh, by and large that was achieved in terms of services to the public. But certainly uh, the city is very, in certain areas, especially in the, at the planning counter, um, permit counter, uh, pretty, very stressed, you know, at this point, because again, with such low interest rates, we're just seeing such a huge amount of development going on in Newport and redevelopment. So that was a big part of it. Um, I would like to say, just adding on here, um, through this whole year, I, I just, as a resident, kind of speaking as a resident, just, I am so impressed with the management and staff on our public safety. I mean, it, to me, just did an incredible job this year and, and meeting the needs of residents of 
keeping the city running, of, of being really quick to pivot in terms of opening, closing City Hall, and figuring out where to be at certain points in this whole pandemic, you know, with the ups and downs that we've had. And I'll just say our, our public safety, our police did a, you know, incredible job in my view uh, over the last summer with the protest, everything that went on. And you see what happened in other cities. Uh, the sort of the psychological understanding of, of crowds and of, of unhappy people and these, these situations that can produce really unintended, unintended consequences and provide a lot of tr problems for the city. We, the public safety and, and particularly the police, but also the fire uh, lifeguards, all of it, you know, just the professionalism was incredible. And I think it's important that all residents know that. And I, I know most get it, but it's not by accident, right? It's because we've hired well, those departments have hired well and they're managed well. And we're in the training and the expectations are high and uh, they're just doing, they're just doing an incredible job. So I think it, it, it's in a crisis when you really see what your team is like. And I think we've seen it this past year and we're coming out of it. And again, even coming out of this, you'll see, we will, the, the team will pivot again toward more services opening up like we've been doing. Uh, and that's all, uh, Grace Leung, our city manager, just running it and, and paying close attention, being really locked into the county and to other city managers and just staying ahead of the wave, if you will. So um, I know when this first hit, the lockdown first hit, uh, they got everybody together in the emergency operations room and uh, went over what was this tidal wave was washing over them at this moment about that it's going to be a whole different world they're going to be operating in. And that happened almost a year ago, exactly from that today. And you look, if you look how we came through from a budget perspective, from services to the public perspective, from, from public safety handling, you know, people forget, but there was huge tensions down by the beach. And we, we had some, uh, some very difficult, some very difficult points with, public gatherings with residents feeling threatened and rightly so. And we got through it and uh, we got through it without people getting hurt. Um, uh, and we managed to protect the property. And, uh, you know, it's, I just think it's, it's, it's an example of, of a really great city. Great. Brad, could you make a brief comment on uh, your previous Occupation, what's all that construction on PCH for Orange Coast College all about? Well, um, that all started with Don Webb, you know. Um, we, <laughs> so the, uh, where I worked there on the, on the highway, right next door to the Bible Bay Club, right where the Sea Scout bases were between the two, and uh, seven lots across PCH came available 20 years ago. And, uh, I made an effort to purchase them, and we ultimately went and did a, a, a partnership with the Orange County Sanitation District, and they took one lot. We took six lots, and uh, we're building a maritime training center for students who want careers in the maritime industry. And this is all part of the state's desire, strong desire to see community colleges uh, uh, produce uh, students that can get jobs, that can be employable right off the bat. So. This is for our students that are interested in maritime careers. Some will transfer to the Maritime Academy. Some will go to work for Boss tugboats in LA. Some will work on the sport fishing boats. But we're getting kids that know zero about boats that don't maybe know what they're going to do next. And they're getting into this program and they're coming out with licenses. They're coming out with uh, the ability to go out and get a job. And uh, it's as straightforward as that. And that's what that building's all about. So the radar simulator room in there, there's a full mission bridge simulator that you'd see on a ship in there. And uh, we're a Coast Guard certified training facility. So um, this is part and parcel to, um, you know, kind of where we are, we're next to the ocean, a lot of interest in boating. So we get a lot of kids are maybe working on the sport fishing boats locally or the ferry, and they want to take their career further. And so we're also providing those that kind of education for them. Mm -hmm. So it's called the Professional Mariner Center. 
and the bridge uh, connects the two facilities. And I wanted to do a crosswalk, and uh, this is 20 years ago, and uh, uh, Mr. Webb said, uh, Don said, you know, I'll never give you a crosswalk. This is when he was director of public works, but you could build a bridge. And uh, so that's how that started. A little more expensive option, but much safer for our students. Very good, very good. Well, Brad, I think it's safe to say that um, uh, that your job is not an easy one at this point in time, but I would summarize it as bringing calm leadership to the city council. And I think that's important. And uh, so certainly thank you for your time today and, uh, and all of your information. We appreciate uh, what you're doing and uh, the job that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you, Rush. And um... I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to encourage people to participate. Um, I, I'm of the line of government should not be trusted. And uh, by that, I mean, we need citizens to participate and ask questions. And uh, we cannot operate in a vacuum. So we need folks to show up to these meetings when they when they occur. And, uh, and I know the chamber uh, is a big part of getting people involved. And that's really important uh, to me. I think the chamber, like so, like so many great organizations we have in this town, is, is an incredible part of our, our fabric, our business community fabric, and our just our, our local uh, community fabric. So these organizations are an important part of our success as well. And uh, so I think uh, the chamber is just an invaluable part of this, uh, and uh, we need to ramp up. We're going to. I think I'm just so excited about summer, and. The, that we're just going to be fully ramped up and, and going. So that's going to be, a, you know, something uh, to see the change. But um, I'm an optimist in this regard. I think it's going to be, it's going to be good. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you again, Brad. I'll just quickly mention two upcoming programs. You, you mentioned what a great uh, staff and management team we have over at City Hall. And on uh, March 18th at our Government Affairs Committee meeting, we're going to be having the city manager, Grace Leung, as our guest speaker. So she'll probably be following up on some of the uh, items and budgetary uh, things that uh, you've discussed here, maybe a little bit more granular because, you know, that's, uh, that's what she gets the big bucks to, to figure out. I remember being, and I'm sure Rush will agree, as a city councilman, we got all the credit, but the, it was the, really the employees that did all the yeoman's work on getting all that stuff done. So uh, we'll be hearing from, from her and what her challenges are. And then on uh, April 1st, we're going to move away from government, but move into education, and our guest speaker will be um, Chapman President Daniele Strupa, who has spoken at Wake Up Newport in the past, probably several years ago at this point. Um, as uh, many of you know that uh, a lot of the colleges are talking about and universities are talking about full in-student um, learning uh, starting in the fall, so we'll be hearing about Chapman's plans and you know how they've kind of coped with the uh, coronavirus situation over the last year as they've had to go, uh, you know, also uh, spin on a dime here and, and uh, go virtual. So two great programs coming up. You can all register for all of that stuff at uh, www.newportbeach.com under our events uh, category. Our programs are free and open to the public. So please uh, pass the links along and encourage your friends and colleagues to join us. And so uh, as you know, on behalf of the chamber, I'll say, you know, thank you for the, your service to the community and uh, the great job that the city council is doing um, you know, keeping our services uh, at 100%, um, our infrastructure at 100%. I see they're already tear tearing up the sidewalks in my neighborhood, getting ready to uh, do some repaving and slurry ceiling. So I'm glad to see that. So clearly, we're not letting maintenance slip here in town. And um, you know, just a it's just a great overall uh, feeling uh, to be you know part of the Newport Beach community. So thank you again, Brad. Thank you, Rush. I would like to clarify one thing that Rush said at the beginning of the program. There are two other mayors on this one. Uh, only one of them is an old mayor. I, I'm, I'm not an old mayor. I'm just another mayor. <laughs> so, nice, Steve. With, with me getting the final word. <laughs> Minor Thank you. definition. Minor definition. <laughs> we'll see you all uh, next time. Thank all you. Right. Be well. Thank you all.